guys, today I'm going to show you how I do ink wash. It's actually a fake ink wash technique using black watercolor, which is easier to, to control, in my opinion, than ink. Um, if you are following along, you'll have noted that the inking and drawing videos for this were both time lapse. Uh, that was because I have already done um, tutorials on inking with a brush. So if you're interested with, in that, you ought to check out my um, other videos in my channel. Uh, the majority of this will be time lapse as well, simply because once I cover the basics, there isn't really a whole lot to say about the topic other than rinse and repeat. If you are familiar with watercolor, this should be a very easy uh, tutorial for you. If you're not familiar with watercolor, this might be a good way to become more familiar with watercolor as you're really only worried about one color and your focus is primarily on contrast. So I have two inked pieces. Um, they are both pitches for an upcoming comic anthology, which will uh, probably be in the works um, by the time this video is uploaded. They were both inked on watercolor paper because I wanted something that could handle the ink wash technique. If you are interested in ink wash, I highly recommend you use a watercolor paper because it's going to make it a lot easier for you. So, um, my next stop, my next step is to stretch these two. And since that's kind of a space consuming, um, a space consuming issue. I'm not going to do it on camera. If you're interested in learning how to stretch watercolor paper, please check out my MechaCon 2014 Watercolor 101 video. It's pretty much everything you need to know about watercoloring for comics at this time that I have up at this time. Um, so I'm going to get back to you guys when these have both been stretched, but I'm only going to work on paint, work on painting one of them. One of them at a time on camera because I just don't have the space to show you. All right, so I will see you guys in a bit. So before we get too far into this, I wanted to take a minute and kind of explain what I'm going to do. These are all three black or um, very dark watercolor colors. I have um, a Holbein neutral tint, which is almost a black, and I use it a lot as a black. I have a Hobian Irodori Antique Black, which is a brownish black, and I have Mary May Blue uh, Carbon Black. So um, it really, really doesn't matter if you're painting with a brownish black or a true black, um, because you're going to be scanning these and you're going to be tweaking them uh, and dropping the color layers so that it's just grayscale. So you're going to lose that anyway. And I don't actually paint directly from the tube when I do my initial passes. I mix it up first and I do swatches. Um, at least that's what I did for my chainmail bikini story, um, uh, Pretty Palette and Critical Missy. And that was because I was painting six pages and I wanted to make sure everything, it looked consistent. But I am painting two standalone illustrations today. So that's less important. Now the Iridori is a very creamy watercolor. Um, the Mary May is cheap, so um, it's cheap but decent. So if you're looking to do big black and white um, faux ink washes, that might be a good option for you. Um, per my personal favorite for uh, Critical Missy was the Antique Black, and the pages in person look gorgeous. Uh, they don't scan quite as nice but they look really good in person. Whoa, what? I... I thought that was a brown, but it's more like what I would think of as an indigo. Mine may have shifted in the palette though. That's a beautiful color. You could honestly use any of these three because you're going to be dropping your, um, you're going to be dropping your color layers, so it's gonna appear as black anyway. So it's really your personal preference. Um, as beautiful as that neutral tint is, and that's a really gorgeous color, um, I'm going to actually use antique black because I've used it before, I'm familiar with it, I like it. So, um, but really it's up to you. This will use up a fair amount of, um, of paint, and I do like using tube paints. They're a little more economical, especially for this kind of a thing. Um, 
I use a uh, half pan in a palette for my comics, but for ink washes, tube is really the way to go because you're not spending a lot of time integrating your pigments into the water. And for these illustrations, I think I'm going to go with the antique black. So my pages are stretching right now. Uh, they're drying out. Um, I do have a comment about the Kuratake. I'm looking for my bottle of it. Here we go. My Kuratake Black Ink 60. It is a waterproof India ink. However, if you put it on too thickly, even if it's fully dried for 24 hours, there'll still be uh, sections that aren't necessarily as cured. So, um, where I'd written gumbo in that black text, that black block text, it started to run when I added water to it, even though it had dried for 24 hours. So I'm going to let that page, I'm going to do that page tomorrow. So it really fully dries. It didn't ruin the page. It doesn't look bad. I'm just giving you guys a warning at home. If you're following along, if you're using the same products that I use, I just don't want you to have a nasty surprise. So I will be uh, ink washing Le Bon Temps Roulet a little bit later today. That's the one of the girl eating the massive mound of boiled crawfish. Okay, so I am pretty much all set up. I've got a cup of clean water. I've got a watercolor paper sketchbook to use as like a scratch testing sheet. I've got my stretched piece. It is dried pretty much warp free. There's a little warp at the top. That's not the biggest deal. I've got a porcelain palette. Oh, excuse me, porcelain pot for mixing. I've got several brushes. They're all rounds in different sizes. And I've got my watercolor. And I haven't done it this way yet. Uh, so I'm gonna put a teeny little bit of my watercolor in the palette. And it's fine if that gets dried out. We're not trying to, um, we're not trying to do anything with it yet. Um, and I'm gonna take some and I'm gonna mix it in another well. And I wanna add a lot of water to it because it is probably pretty concentrated. And I wanna use it as like my lightest wash if I possibly can. So I'm gonna clean out my brush, dab it off and test the color. That's pretty light. It's a pretty good base color. Now, um, now that I've got that mixed, it just reminded me that I actually wanted to mask some areas and I'm looking for my graphics masking pen. And I'm not seeing it. I thought I had it handy. I think, I guess I must've tossed it somewhere. That's annoying because I got to pause the video and I thought I had it up. I have a tray of supplies right up there and I thought it was in there, but it's not. So I got to find it now. All right, I got it. And what I'm going to do with this is I am going to, because I want to apply a wash as quickly as possible. I'm going to shake it up, test it out, get it going. Mm -hmm. That's weird, doesn't wanna apply the way it did yesterday. I was hoping not to have to. There, I got it going. So the problem with these is the um, masking fluid will form a film. It's still a lot easier then. And I want to, um, ah, what the heck? I wanted to carefully apply a masking fluid uh, film and uh, reserve like my corn, my shrimp. Let me get in there so you can see. My corn, my shrimp, all of the really light colored elements from this pile, except that for some reason, graphics wants to reactivate. So I have to use a really light hand apparently. And I can come back later on in the process and add color again by removing my masking fluid and um, just applying color. This is just an easy way that allows me to quickly apply large washes of color. Also gonna apply it to the bottom of the crab. It might seem like this sort of prep takes too much time, 
but it really makes everything else faster. Because I'm not painting around these areas. And it only takes a moment to dry. And this sort of um, a masking fluid applicator actually, uh, it's easier to use in my opinion than traditional masking fluid because I would have to, you know, go get like a scrap full brush that I don't mind getting ruined. And I'd have to get a cup of clean water. And I mean, this is just an easier way to achieve the same result. Except when it reactivates my, uh, my ink. And this is going to take a minute to dry and it'll still feel tacky if you uh, scratch, move your hand over it, but it's dry. It's just uh, the latex and it wants to stick to your hand a little bit. And something important about a big pile like this um, is you want to maintain contrast. So if you put some areas of masking fluid here or there, it'll help break up the pile so it's not just like a lump. And for those of you who might be wondering what this says, it's um, like Cajun Pigeon French. Uh, I'm from Luling, Louisiana, which is like 20 to 30 minutes outside of New Orleans across the Mississippi River. Um, and I'm not Cajun, I'm actually Creole. Uh, Cajun is a specific thing. Uh, your family came from Acadiana in Canada, which was a French settlement. They were forced out by the British. Um, and my family actually came to United States around the same time, but they pretty much went straight. I mean, I have Canadian family, but that's British Canadian. Um, they pretty much went straight to Louisiana. They were like a provincial French, not any kind of fancy French. And my family's been in Louisiana for a really, really long time. And uh, this phrase, this pigeon French phrase, les bons temps roulés, it means let the good times roll. And when I lived in Louisiana, I hated it. Because it was, it was what tourists would, it was like the sort of thing tourists would say, or like people who are trying to play up how Louisiana they are. It's the sort of stuff they would say. And I just, I couldn't stand it because I was like so caught up in all of the things I, all of the things I didn't like about living in Louisiana. Because I'd never lived anywhere else and my family didn't do family vacations, right? So I had like a really limited, uh, sheltered upbringing. I guess you could say. Um, but now that I live in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, I still am not like a big fan of like showy Louisiana things. Like I don't care for Florida Lees. Um, I hate the Saints, the, the football team with a burning fiery passion, like can't stand them. Um, I hate LSU <laughs> with a burning fiery passion. Uh, but there are other, like I, want to focus on the things about Louisiana that people don't think about. Um, unfortunately with this, I'm pitching it to a comic anthology and I figured it would be a good idea to include some stuff that like everybody thinks about. I note I didn't put like Mardi Gras beads on her or anything ridiculous like that. I'm also, by Louisiana standards, kind of considered a stick in the mud. So, you know, don't think everybody has the same annoyances that I do. I just wanted to get out as fast as possible and have a di my own life. And now that I have my own life, I'm like, I kind of miss being at home. Because there's a lot of stuff I really liked about Louisiana. Like, I love boiled seafood and you can't get that in Nashville. And I wasn't, I didn't bring up the fact that I'm not Cajun to like, uh, I don't actually have 
I'm not saying like anything about Cajun people. It's just that in the area I grew up in, uh, everyone pretty much claimed they were Cajun, even though they by far weren't. A lot of them were, but a lot of them also were Creole or just other things. Um, so when we were taught Louisiana history, it was very much from a Cajun point of view and we glossed over it everything else like african-american history for example so now we've got a generation of people who are kind of ups kind of upset about you know their lost heritage and as one of the people whose heritage has always been glossed over i'm kind of frustrated by that too so i wasn't railing on cajuns i'm just saying that you know that's not all there is to the area not everybody in Louisiana is Cajun. Not everyone who's lived in Louisiana for a really long time is Cajun. That seems to be one of the like big common misconceptions. Also, everybody thinks we all love to drink, uh, and that's not also not the case. So I'm putting down this first layer of ink wash, and I'm using kind of a big brush, but I'm trying to be careful with my edges. As you can see, the blue has reserved it, which breaks up the shape nicely. It's not just like a blob of seafood right now. And I will be adding a lot of other details as I go along. And you want to be careful with um, like a, a collection of things like this, not to add too many details because it will get overwhelming. So it's all about finding like that balance, which is why I didn't draw every single crustacean and corn and potato in the pile as I didn't want to visually overwhelm the the consumer with too much detail. Went out of the line a little bit. Hey, come on. It's not, it's not the biggest deal, but you know. And this pitch illustration will also, um, I'm working on a Louisiana book, which is like, it's kind of like a travel guide, but it's more about um, having grown up in the area, but not living in the area any longer. And this illustration um, will probably also be in that travel book. The same goes for the anatomy of gumbo. Now it's running and it's not so scratchy. So the neat thing about using watercolors rather than ink is that the sort of techniques... Yeah, I'm having trouble today because I'm not getting brushes that are thirsty enough to get started. Uh, there we go. Is you can do a lot of the techniques you would normally do with watercolor. So you can blend things out the way you would have with watercolor. You can apply shadow the way you would with watercolor. I find that ink performs a little unpredictably. So, um, I would rather use watercolor than ink. And I should probably switch to a smaller brush because I'm doing like everything in my power to make this as difficult and frustrating as possible, it seems like. I'm doing it on camera. That always, always means I'm going to mess up somewhere. I'm talking, so that definitely means I'm going to mess up because I'm distracted. I'm trying to explain what I'm doing which means I am dividing my thought processes instead of focusing. Using too big a brush, trying to work in too small a workspace, working flat, and just like lit litany of things I'm doing that I really shouldn't be doing them this way. But I'm trying to demonstrate something to you guys. So now we have a base layer and you have a couple options. You can let it dry or you can start knocking in 
some shadow on big shapes like this. And what you're going to get is you're going to get some runs, which uh, aren't necessarily a bad thing. It just means the color is diffused a little bit more. I am trying to think about where shadows would be, even if I am also trying to get this locked in kind of quick. Definitely want to lock it in at the bottom too. And uh, it's probably time, about time for me to move to a smaller brush because I'm having a little bit of difficulty getting the things knocked in that I want to. And basically when you're watercoloring or doing ink wash, you want to work with as large a brush as possible for as long as possible. That will help prevent things from getting overworked and muddy too quickly. Okay, so I'm gonna wait for her hand to dry before I add some shade to her skin. But it's about time to move to a smaller brush and after I do her to mix in a darker color. Now what I can do, however, is mix uh, a light shade for the table and apply that after the everything else has kind of dried so there's no backgrounds. So I'm gonna let it dry and I'll get back to you guys. You guys can see that the second layer of ink wash really didn't provide much visual contrast. It's not much darker than the initial layer. So I'm gonna have to go back and really darken that up. But for now, I'm going to quickly apply a wash to the tablecloth. And I could have even more quickly applied a wash if I had um, bothered to use masking fluid on the shrimp and the cups and the lemon, but I didn't because I got lazy, I guess. I don't know, I think I just forgot. Um, and just knocking in a little bit of shadow there. And while I'm working with this light wash, I can knock in some shadow on the white part of her dress and the silver part of her cracker and on the flower a little bit. You guys don't know how hard this is doing it at a table on camera. This is a real pain in the butt. Dabbing out the extra ink wash because I want it to um, get a little lighter than it is right now. And I'm just using a plain Viva paper towel for that. And I also wanted to add some up here. Usually I like to paint with uh, the board on my lap on the floor. So this is a bit like pushing a boulder uphill for me. Hopefully it'll make me stronger. All right, so got a lot of the basics knocked in. Going to let that dry, clean off my brush and um, move to another layer on our skin, but I want a little more contrast than I had before. Oh, come on. I guess I'm stuck with this brush because it just sucked up all my remaining paint and it says, I'm dry. Thanks. It means I need to add more water and use a smaller brush when I'm mixing. And I'm really glad that I'm not trying to do six pages of like this, the way I did with Chainmail Bikini. With Chainmail Bikini, I had like a couple of the plastic palettes, the big 10, well, round plastic palettes. You can get those like anywhere though. Um, and I mixed everything and I worked in like colors. So I did like one tone at a time 
it took forever, but I was also doing six pages at a time. So, you know, as soon as one thing dried, it was time to do, I mean, as soon as like I had done all this, all six pages, it was time to move, whatever. I'm talking in circles right now, aren't I? As soon as one page was dry, gosh, I'm done. I'm done with that. I'm done explaining that because I'm killing it. I'll just move on to adding some tone and contrast here and then I'll do her skin. Nice thing about doing one page at a time is I'm not worried about matching colors. I'm just worried about readability and capturing a feel and good contrast. And when I've moved away the, um, when I've removed the film, the uh, masking fluid, that's the word. When I move the masking fluid, you're gonna see even more contrast because that's gonna be the white of the paper. Also kind of doing this on a deadline because the pitches are due on the 1st of February and we're almost finished with January right now. Although if you guys see this before March, I would be surprised. I'm at this point, I'm kind of thinking about like uh, increasing my update schedule right now. It's once a week on Saturdays, but I'm kind of thinking about increasing it. Of course, my video editor does not like that because that means he's got to do twice as much work but I'd like to see the channel continue to grow. And I think sometimes it gets bogged down because uh, I, um, for reviews, I'll release the videos in, in pieces for my uh, readers, the blog readers, to kind of like make it easy for them to decide what they're gonna consume and when. Um, but it probably makes it more difficult for my watchers because it mean, I mean, I'm only posting one piece of that at a time. So I don't run out of um, my my cue as quickly. I'm still not getting as much contrast as I would like with this pile. So I'm gonna have to mix my next layer for this really dark, I guess. See, when you, this, it works out a little bit better, honestly, with black and white because you can always make it darker. You can always go darker. Um, but when this happens with uh, color, it, that's when you start getting really muddy. Or one of the ways you can get a really muddy piece is just like there's no contrast. You're not mixing things dark enough. Part of the problem is I'm also trying to work kind of quickly. And with ink wash, when you're working with dark colors, they often will dry a lot lighter than they initially go down, which um, can throw you. And when I'm doing comics, I pretty much never use black. Uh, so I'm not exactly all that familiar with how this color dries. However, this should be okay for her skin also kind of a dry day today so everything I'm putting down is drying before I have a chance to blend it out. Oh over here that's just a clean brush of water because I wanted to soften the transition on her face. I think you can probably see by now what I mean about what works for watercolor. Ugh, I think it's gonna bleed out. Dang it, too much water. Um, what works for watercolor also works with this type of ink wash. Fake ink wash, because it's really just watercolor. It, it's important to, uh, if you notice a mistake, if you notice an issue, to correct it as you go because it is gonna be a lot harder to fix later on. I 
All right, so I need to let that dry. And then I'm gonna finish adding shade to her skin with this current mixture. And then I'm gonna mix my cart colors a little bit darker. All right, today is such a dry day that my first uh, this layer dried pretty much instantly, which is a little frustrating to be honest, because it means it isn't as workable. It does mean though that I can continue working. And I can feel where my hand is sticking to the masking fluid, which is kind of annoying makes it a little difficult to work carefully. And I'm already going to fill in her hair. This is not the color, her, her hair is gonna be a lot darker than this, but I want a shine on her hair, and I don't want the shine to be straight white. So I am adding in the first layer. So her, so the shine has somewhere to go, if that makes sense. All right, so it's time to mix my color darker. And I might just work straight from here. That's good dark color. And I can always use another brush to kind of blend things out. But it's so dry today that this paper doesn't want to allow me to rework things too much. So I have to work quickly. But I am also trying to work carefully so I don't get rid of all of the contrast I've been working hard, well, failing at, but working hard to build, especially with this new very dark layer. And see, it actually dries very, a lot lighter than I had anticipated. Even though I'm pretty much working directly from uh, the black. Still, this method of, of um, like faking an ink wash is still a lot easier than doing a real ink wash. So I might seem like I'm complaining a lot, but I'm really not. I've just kind of set myself up to fail in a way because I, I have all this in the way. I could probably remove them. And in fact, I might do that before the next step because they're really affecting my ability to, to work. I don't really want that to dry as a blob, so I'm going to try to break it up a little bit. And of course, I'm still going to have to go in and do all the shrimp and the corn. There we go, finally getting some movement. And it seems like it's gonna dry kinda light. So, gonna have to keep pushing and pulling, working back and forth to build up contrast on this pile of goodies. And it's making me hungry. I haven't had boiled seafood in a few months. Can't get them. They're not good in Nashville, basically. Too far away from the ocean and too far away from the swamps. And this piece would probably be a lot of fun to do in color. Uh, I am just based on my prior experience with the anthology I'm pitching to, um, I don't think color is really an option though for, for them, so. I did design it to also work in black and white. Just color would be a lot of fun. Because you have like all these shades of pink and red with the crabs and the crawfish and the shrimp. And then you have um, like pops of yellow with the corn and the the lemons here and there. You know what's funny is my family never really boiled the lemons with 
the seafood. It was kind of an on the side if you want it thing. But I know a lot of people do boil it together. And my family would also put down this like, they would either put down plastic visqueen um, because this gets really, really messy uh, when you're eating it. Or we would have uh, like those tacky red and white vinyl checkerboard uh, tablecloths, which is why there's a checkerboard tablecloth in this illustration because it makes me think of a crawfish boil. That clicking sound is uh, my hand hitting the bulldog clips. Too dark. Thinks it looks too dark. Probably dry pretty light because everything else has been drying too light today. I hope my head's not getting in the shot too much. Whenever I have the camera pulled in like this, it tends to happen. I might try to have a crawfish boil for my upcoming birthday next month. Uh, some, every, okay, so when I visit Louisiana and I tell people, like, like restaurants and stuff, you know, like, oh, I haven't, I don't get to have this very often because I don't live around here anymore. And they're like, oh, we ship, we ship all over the country. And then I find out they only ship for like massive corporate events. Why would you tease me? It's not fair don't have 300 Nashville friends is not worth it. I don't have a freezer big enough to, to store all of that, all those leftovers. I will be making seafood gumbo for like months, once a week for months. Oh, well, that's the best that's gonna get. You know, I had said I'm Butterfingers today. It's hard to work like this. I might cheat. It's not cheating. I might not record me working on the gumbo one just because this is kind of an uncomfortable working situation for me. So I think I need to let this layer dry before I can progress and, and remove the, um, what's it called? The liquid frisket, the whatever, the blue stuff. So I can judge how the contrast is going. Masking fluid, there we go. All right, you gotta go. You can't see them, but you're showing away. So in the way. These are gonna have to go too. They are also so in the way. They weren't so in the way at that particular second. Another thing I usually do is I usually move my palette, like, I'm sorry, my painting surface around a lot. I got a brush in my mouth, sorry. Uh, and I just can't. I can't do that. It's just too limited a space. I got a cat under my foot who thinks I'm petting him and I'm really just like moving my foot around. And apparently I had a brush hiding underneath full time. I bet I should have masked those out. But really, when you're doing ink wash like this, the most important thing you want to maintain is contrast, because details will get lost. And you don't have color to help you out. 
Also, it will trick you into thinking things are darker than they really are. So it becomes easy to lose that contrast that you're working so hard to build up. See, see how light that's drawing? I'm losing that contrast between her, her, her like tan dark skin. I want it to be darker actually. Uh, her tannish skin and her hair. Losing that contrast already. But fortunately, that wasn't the only layer I was going to do on her hair. Needs to dry more. Oh, I think I want to go dark on her dress. And when I say too dark, I mean it was just pretty much pure tube paint, like gouache, like very little. It was not watercolor, it was not ink wash. See what I mean though when I, like the, the browns in this um, particular type of black paint, they look so nice in my opinion, like in real life. And when you scan it, you will lose that, but I mean, you know, you were gonna lose that anyway, because it's ink wash is black and white. And you have to, ugh. 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 You have to be careful when you scan it. Because, uh, you know, it becomes, if you're not scanning it at a high enough DPI, if you're not careful with how you mas remaster it, you're, going to lose a lot of the beautiful, um, like, just like the watercolory aspects of ink wash that makes it beautiful. It'll start looking pixelated and messy. You might lose some of your contrast. So you, you have to be careful in this, with this medium. And I mean, since my focus is watercolor comics, you know, I don't, I use what I learned from scanning 7-inch Kara and printing Kara to try and make sure I get the best results I can with ink wash. A lot of publishers used to be very hesitant about printing ink wash and watercolor because they, they claimed that it was hard to reproduce. And part of the problem is if your artists, if the artists who are submitting work to you didn't do their best to digitize it, then it's just going to be, you know, a battle from that point because that's the best version you're getting unless you take the original from them and, you know, re-digitize it. Should consider leaving her um, neckerchief bib crawfish catcher. I ought to leave that kind of uh, a lighter color probably to help maintain the contrast I've got going on right now. The brush is getting blurry. See her dress pretty much looks like it's like straight up black which was not really what I'd intended. I'm having a lot of trouble today with mixing colors, apparently. Making mistakes all over the place. Put it on out, but I can't make that no more. I think it helps if you sing stupid songs while you work, especially when you make a mistake. Then you care a little bit less. You're like, oh, but I've sung a goofy song. It's everything better. So sing a dumb song and we'll get along. Oh, oh. oh. Okay. It wasn't so dry today. It makes it very hard to do the watercolor things I would normally do.
So if you let this first layer of stripes dry before you apply the second, where they cross, you'll get a darker color. If you don't allow the stripes to dry, it'll be the same color. Um, and I want it to look like those tacky vinyl checkerboard tablecloths of my youth. So I'm gonna let it dry so I can get that crisscross effect. I call them tacky, but if you know anything about me, I actually really like tacky things. So maybe I should say nostalgic. That's what it is for me, it is very nostalgic. See how light it's drying? That's so frustrating. It's going down very dark. This is how you can end up with uh, your contrast being just all funky because you went by um, wet, what the colors look like when they're wet. And then they dry on you and it's just like a mess. a little bit better. So it looks like my mask, everything that would be on masking fluid is dry. So I'm using a masking fluid eraser to pick it up. It's kind of time consuming at this point. And you see my little corns are still left white. And I mean, I'm going to have to add something to them. Can't just leave them little white corns, but that definitely puts contrast back into my piece. Tore the paper a little bit there. I guess I didn't wait until it was fully dry. Thought it was, but it wasn't. It's just a little tear, but it's a little frustrating too, because this kind of stuff isn't supposed to tear your watercolor paper. Masking fluid is not supposed to tear your watercolor paper. This one's gonna tear too, I bet you. You can see though where it ripped the paper a little bit. So disappointing, come on. I guess, I guess, I guess I could have applied it and walked away for an hour and let it fully cure, but it doesn't say that on the instructions. I've never encountered um, a masking fluid container that recommended that. That's just what I would, if it's giving me these kind of problems, that's what I would try. So maybe in the future I will try that. I mean, you know. Kinda spoils the spontaneous nature of oh, another tear. All right, well, that goes, there goes that, you know. I guess don't use graphics. It's a shame because it was in such, it's in a con really convenient container. You don't need a brush, you don't need water. You can just like apply it and let it go. So that's a shame. Oh, and the paper I am ink washing on is Canson Montval, which is not the greatest watercolor paper ever. Um, it's got a lot of problems, but I use it for like illustration work in comics because it is economical. And it runs through my printer so I can do blue lines which was what you saw me inking over the other day. Printed out blue lines of, ah, it's tearing the paper again. Printed out blue lines of a sketch I did. And see when it tears the paper that ruins the paper surface and I get all these other problems like bleeding and feathering and loss of control. So, I mean, you know, it's more than just an inconvenience problem or an aesthetic problem of, oh, it wrecked that one line it's a problem of, oh, it's gonna cause a lot of other problems in the future. And I mean, when it had just torn like one, in one place, I was like, okay, well, that's the sacrifice you make. Sometimes for convenience. But now I'm getting kind of angry at it. Ugh. 
Ah, oh, another. It's torn the paper like five times. All right, so that's what it looks like with all of the non, uh, I almost said non photo blue, and it is probably about enough. Oh, gosh, it really tore up the paper. That's what it looks like with all of the, the masking fluid removed. So now I'm going in and trying to have a very light hand with a light gray. Because I want to give these objects some shadow, but I worked hard to reserve that contrast. So I don't want to just give that away. Of course, you can feel with your brush where it's torn because it just doesn't handle the same way as fresh paper would. Sorry about that. Over the crown, kind of blend the two together, make it look like I didn't just, you know, put down a, you don't want it to look like you just put down a bunch of masking fluid. You want it to look like you were very fastidious and careful and you worked around it. And it's not considered cheating, by the way, to use masking fluid. Uh, most of the professional watercolors do use it. Um, you just don't want it to look like, I mean, maybe you do. Maybe you have a style that relies on that, you know. For this piece, I don't want it to look like. I just left a bunch of areas unpainted, basically. a little more water. It's a little dark considering it's all that trouble. Of course where the paper's torn, you know, does have other problems. It doesn't quite take the the paint the same way a fresh untorn up You know, earlier today, I was watching a Lemia Crescent video and she had used uh, the Daniel Smith uh, masking fluid to reserve her areas of white and it tore up her paper too. And I was thinking to myself, wow, I'm so lucky because graphics hasn't done that to me yet. Womp womp. Yet was the operative word there. really tore up my paper surface. I'm not happy about that. It's also hard to remove completely. There's areas where as I bring the brush over it, it shows up again, even though I was working very carefully to remove it all. Almost would have been better just leaving it as, as it was. I didn't expect that to happen that way. And I wouldn't have advised you guys to try using it if I had known that was going to happen. Because I don't like giving you guys bad advice. So now it's mostly just a case of nitpicking and fine tuning. Uh, darkening some things, adding details to some things. Trying not to overwork it. Finishing her, her scar. Oh yeah, I gotta do that other, the other line. I'll probably cut that out digitally. Although maybe not. We'll find out, right? Those lines are looking janky. So we are nearing the finish line, I think. <laughs> Getting there. I'm getting to the point where I go in and I continue darkening some things. Or I might add a lighter, a light wash to just better unify other things. back in those areas where that white might have like over overstepped its boundary. I'm gonna need to add some shading to some crawfish. It's 
so it's Friday here, and um, one of the things that happened this week is I applied to have an artist table at MTAC, and uh, they, I don't, I'm not going to find out until they say on Monday they're going to let everybody know, and uh, uh, my chances are probably a little slimmer this year simply because they're reducing the number of tables, and they also had like some site malfunctions, so even though I was like, bam, there, it was hard for me to submit my application and it's first come first serve. Anyway, um, in general, that would be something I would be nervous and anxious about because I rely on MTAC. It's one of my big cons. Um, I live in the Nashville area now. I have a lot of fans who come to see me. I make good money at that show, money that I don't make necessarily doing other shows. So um, it's an important con to me, but I've been so busy getting this ready, the my pitch ready for something that's also due that Monday that I've been distracted. I mean, I turned in everything I needed to turn in. It's not like I like forgot. It's just, it's nice that I have something else going on to kind of keep me from hyper-focusing and fretting about something I can't really control at this point. Of course, then I'll fret about this, you know. Joy of anxiety problems. They don't leave you alone. And you, but I mean, if you're like, if you're an artist and you're, you find yourself fretting over like tables or submissions, something that I've personally found that helps me is I try to keep myself as busy as possible. I try to have other stuff going on. So I'm not just thinking about the thing that's coming up. I'm thinking about a lot of other things. Like, uh, something else that's currently going on in my life is Chainmail Bikini finally launched. Uh, gosh, that wrong one. Thousand and One Nights finally launched on Kickstarter. And it's been, like, over a year since I submitted my comic to them. And uh, the funding is going really well. So I'm excited about that. I like doing anthologies. Um, I tend to get lost, forgotten in the crowd sometimes. Um... I'll see other contributors at cons and I'll be like, I really liked your piece. And they'll be like, you were in it? And it was like, yup, it's only 20 of us. But other than that, I like, I like doing them. Um, I live in kind of a not comics area. So, you know, this is often the only way I can, I can do stuff with a comics community is online. And Thousand and One Nights met its funding goal in like two days. So hopefully, hopefully that means we have great things ahead of us. Um, from a financial standpoint, I could always use, I can always use the additional income that a good, a well-funded Kickstarter can bring in. conventions mean traveling and traveling means time spent not working and also money spent on just traveling stuff so you know it's nice to have some income come in that isn't tied to a convention table basically and it'll be nice to have a comic another comic that isn't um, all me to sell at my table. And I'm probably going to do like, I mean, by the time this video is loaded, it will be too late for you guys to back it, unfortunately. But I, um, I do plan on doing like a, hey, check this out video that will be released sooner. Trying to dig up my concept work for the project so I can show that kind of stuff. I'm just darkening the areas where the, the stripes meet. Since it wasn't as great a contrast as I would have liked. And it looks like her scarf is dry, so I can go back to that. I mean, really, this is pretty much what watercolor is. It's just like endless, endless back and forth. This is even easier, though, because with watercolor, you're juggling multiple colors and you're 
juggling tones and you're juggling just like a lot going on with watercolor. But with this, it's pretty much black and white. So if you are interested in water, learning how to watercolor, doing ink washes, ink studies, contrast studies might help you out a lot. And really it's only the cost of a tube of paint, a tube of black paint of your choice and some uh, India ink waterproof. Make sure it's waterproof. Water resistant ink will actually push your color away. So you don't want that. You want waterproof. Because you'll get these lines of resistance that you don't want. Only way to know will be to wait for it to dry and see how the contrast looks. I already kind of goofed up the contrast on her scarf because it's almost the same color as her skin. And I can, there are ways you can fix that a little bit. Another thing you can and should do is you should probably step away every now and then. Let your eyes kind of readjust to what you're seeing. That'll help you see things you might have missed before. And I should be the sort of person who takes her own advice and I should pause the video and do that. Because that will help me make a better overall piece. I am a cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater and I didn't actually get up and go anywhere. I should have, but I didn't. Um, but I am going to go ahead and um, stay the course, even though I think the neckerchief is indeed not dark enough. And what I might do with that is use gouache, or I'm sorry, too dark, too, it doesn't contrast enough with her skin. Um, what I might do about that is use gouache to do like a, like a little checker pattern on it, kind of mimic the table, which should help solve the problem. It would also add visual interest. Otherwise, I am nearing the end of this piece, at least for uh, un undigitized, nearing the undigitized end. And there are definitely areas that I need to darken a bit. And I'm really kind of frustrated by how fast everything is drawing. Um, if I was using a um, cotton-based watercolor paper, the dry time would be a little bit slower. I think my head is entering the shot. Um, the dry time would be a little bit slower because the cotton fibers would better absorb the water and hold on to it. But it is evaporating really quickly because it's dry outside today. And usually that dry outside today would be a good thing. But uh, for what I'm trying to do, it's actually kind of frustrating. The thing about watercolor is there's so many elements of it that you just can't do anything about. So you have to just kind of roll with it and be like, all right, I'll make the best out of it and try to learn from it for the next time. That's all you can do. And you have to be forgiving with yourself if you are interested in becoming a watercolorist. So you're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of times where you just mess up and it's not even your fault. And she, I might even just like paint over her arms and to bump up that contrast. arms are gonna end up so much darker than her face. So I'm gonna end up angry. Angry at myself for doing something so impulsive on camera. Certainly at least bumped up the contrast though between her, uh, her neckerchief and her skin, which is good. And uh, I have no problem with her being darker skinned. I just didn't want to lose uh, like details and stuff 
me, you know. Especially since I am having problems with the paper today. But I guess I will just roll with it. Embrace what happens as best as I can, because I'm a little bit of a control freak when it comes to my work. I'm trying to apply it quickly but accurately because it is so dry outside that um, if I wait, it will dry and look bad. So I'm gonna have to like pretty much start laying in contrast on her skin again. Let's see if I can soften that a little bit. But I have to wait until it dries to see how it turns out because it's drying so much lighter. All right, so I'm gonna let her dry and then we can recommence. And you can see how bad the damage is or is not. All right, so her skin actually dried a lot better than I thought it would. I was really afraid that it was gonna get blotchy just because that's what the weather is like today, you know? Um, but I do need to go in and add back some of the details that I kind of lost when I bumped up the contrast. And that's not really, that's not a big deal. I'm not complaining about that or anything. I'm just um, pointing out that a lot of this is pushing and pulling your paint and your pigments until you get what you need from them. So don't worry if it takes you a while. Uh, they really, unless you're on a deadline, there really isn't like, this isn't a race, you know. You don't get points for finishing first. It also helps that watercolor layers well on itself. Ink doesn't always. So if you are using ink ink for your ink wash, this might be another reason to consider switching. I did lose um, a little bit of the contrast with her hair. Again, not the end of the world. I mean, honestly, if you are just sort of getting started, getting into ink wash, you might find it um, best to just give yourself a lot of time to, to complete pieces. Or expect it to take a while. Okay, so I pretty much lost her mouth in this. I gotta go back in there and darken her mouth up. Darken her eyes a little bit. And I'm gonna have to pull out the white wash and uh, make some corrections too. Just trying to build up some more contrast in the seafood. But I also don't want to obliterate all details either. Like I want you to know, I want you to be able to tell it's a pile of seafood. So maybe I should show a little bit of restraint and back off. Okay, so I think I'm gonna allow this to fully dry and um, then I'm gonna pull out my white gouache and start adding in some white. I'm gonna try to pull that stupid, yeah, come on. Come on, or did you stay in the paper? There's like a little bit of blue graphics right there. Oh, actually, before I do that, I did want to. My hand is starting to encounter the area where the paper is buckling a little bit pulling up a little bit um, and it makes it a little bit harder <laughs> to ink right there or the, the letter I am not the best letter at you know in good conditions so I have to be even more careful 
Stop nitpicking. You're not improving it necessarily, just picking at it. Okay. Alright, time to let it dry. Okay, so we're almost done, and instead of using gouache, which can be kind of annoying to use sometimes, I'm going to use Copic Opaque White. I do have the one that has the tiny brush. I hate that tiny brush. So I'm going to be using the not tiny brush one. And I'm using a damp brush, damp, very fine synthetic brush, to start applying some white highlights. And I just kind of want to be light-handed with it because I don't want it to, you know, take over. And basically, right now, just kind of adding white to the areas that have, you know, gotten painted over. making the big old sparklies in her eyes much more distinct. Yeah. Now that, that's the face I make when I'm going to eat boiled crawfish. That is the face of somebody who knows what is going to come. And my focus with adding white back into the crawfish mound isn't really to like really define any particular form. It's just to add a little bit of contrast back and um, hopefully make it a little bit easier to tell that this is a pile of boiled seafood that's going to get eaten. And it really doesn't take much water to get the opaque white going, but you do need a little bit. All right, that's looking pretty good to me. I think I might call it finished. I'm Becca Hilburn. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my tutorial on using black watercolor for ink wash illustrations. Uh, if you want more content like this, please subscribe to my channel. And if you enjoy this video, please hit like. It helps other people find my work on YouTube. I hope you guys have a great day. Um, thanks for watching. Bye. So you know how I said the video was done? It's not done. I decided it would look better with a little bit of like an outline around the outer edge. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Do you mean a lot? I totally thought the video was done. I really did. Even told my cat it was done and that, you know, that is that is how you're done. Is when you tell your cat it's done. It's how you know it's finished. So even told my cat it was finished and it wasn't finished. Just adding a very faint like shadow uh, to just sort of ground it onto the picture plane. I mean really faint. It might not even scan but I think it makes it actually look better. Makes it look like it like belongs on the paper instead of it just like floating on top of it. I think, I think, I think, I think. I say that, and I'm like, oh, yeah, there's some music. A little bit of shadow down to the bottom there. And then I'm like, that crab there, he's getting lost. I need to, I need to do something about that. All right. See, this is what I mean about let it dry, step away, come back with fresh eyes, and you'll see other stuff that needs correcting because like I could do that like all day just spend my whole life correcting my old my finished stuff
got to be a point where I'm like, all right, that's that. But I think hope, hope, that's that. 